So this is the third installment on how to name compounds. This time we're going to look at a binary covalent compound. Uh, covalent compounds are also known as molecular compounds, and they are made from two nonmetals that are covalently bonded together. And a covalent bond is formed when atoms share electrons. And we'll go into a lot more detail about the covalent bond in upcoming chapters. You'll find that naming binary molecular compounds is a lot easier than naming ionic compounds. These compounds have two elements and both are nonmetals. To name these compounds, you're going to look at the first nonmetal. You're going to write the name of that nonmetal with a prefix indicating the number of atoms. If the number of atoms is 1, and you will know that by looking at the subscript, we would not use the prefix mono in this position. We're then going to look at the second nonmetal. We're going to write the name of the second nonmetal with its prefix indicating the number of atoms. This time, if it is 1, we will include the prefix mono, and then we will add the suffix "-ide". So here you see some common prefixes that you use with molecular compounds. You are only responsible for using the prefixes of mono through deca, which correspond to the subscripts of 1 through 10. You must memorize these, so try to make some flashcards and practice these daily until you have them memorized. So let's take a look at example 10. The first thing I want you to notice is that it is a binary compound consisting of two nonmetals. First thing that we're going to do is draw a line to cut those in half, and we're going to focus in on the subscripts. From your list of prefixes, you will notice that the 2 has a prefix of di, and the 5 has a prefix of penta. So following the rules, we're going to take the first nonmetal, we're going to give the prefix di, regular element name, phosphorus, we're going to use the prefix for the second nonmetal, which is penta, and then we're going to take the element's name and we're going to change it so that it ends in ide, oxide, diphosphorus, penta oxide. Normally what we do is if there's an A and an O sitting next to each other, we remove the A off the prefix and it's really diphosphorus pentoxide. Example 11 is the same situation. We're going to go ahead and we're going to draw a line between the two nonmetals. You'll notice that there is not a subscript under silicon, so that means there is actually just one silicon there. We're going to focus in on those subscripts. So our list of prefixes says that when you have a 1 as a subscript, it is mono. But we're never going to use the prefix mono in the first position. So we're just going to put the regular name, which is silicon, for the first nonmetal. And then we will look at the 4, match it up to a prefix, which is tetra. And then we will add that to the fluoride, and we end up getting silicon tetrafluoride. It's self-check time. You're going to go ahead and write the name of the following compounds, and then when you switch to the next slide, you will see the answers. Let's go over the answers. In the first example, you will see that sulfur does not have a subscript. That means there is only one, and we never use the prefix mono in the first position. So the name is just going to be sulfur, and then the two is di, and then remember every second nonmetal ends in I, dioxide. So for the next one, we're going to have di nitrogen tetra chloride. For the third one, we're going to have tetra phosphorus deca oxide. Remember, really, we should be removing that A, and it should say tetra phosphorus decoxide. And then the last one, you'll notice that neither of those two elements have a subscript. So they both are only one atom. And we don't use the prefix mono in the first position, but we do use it in the second position. And you'll see that I did remove one of the O's. Instead of saying monoxide, we just say carbon monoxide. So this is a flowchart on how to name compounds. I want you to take a few minutes to look over it and make sure it makes sense. This will be very helpful in the next self-check where I will mix ionic and covalent chemical formulas and you will have to name them. So in this self-check, we have mixed practice. The first thing you're going to have to do is identify the compound as either ionic, containing a metal and a nonmetal, 
or covalent molecular, which is two nonmetals. And then you will follow the rules that we have learned over the last couple of sessions. Make sure to refer back to your flowchart if you have any questions. So go ahead and write the name of the following compounds, and then in the next slide we'll go over the answers. So let's take a look at the first example, Na2O. I know that it is ionic because Na is a metal. I also know that it's binary. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut it in half. I'm going to name the metal with its regular element name, which is sodium. And then since there is a single nonmetal in the back, it will end in ide, sodium oxide. In the second example, I also can tell it is ionic because K is also a metal. But this time it is a ternary ionic compound. And so I have to identify the polyatomic ion. Remember when we see two capital letters sitting next to each other, that generally refers to a polyatomic ion. And you can always look on your reference sheet to make sure that it exists. So in this case right here, I'm going to divide it behind the K because PO4 is called phosphate. K is a type 1 metal, so we're just going to give it its regular metal name, which is potassium. And then the name of the polyatomic ion goes behind it, phosphate. In the third example, it is also ionic. Once again, I see a metal. It's also a ternary ionic compound. I see a parentheses. I see two capital letters in those parentheses. That is a polyatomic ion. I'm going to cut it before that. But now I have a type 2 metal. Remember, type 2 metals are transition metals, and they can have more than one charge. So in this case, I'm going to give the regular metal name of copper, and I'm going to end it with hydroxide, the name of the polyatomic ion. But then I need to go ahead and figure out what the charge of the copper ion is. So remember, in order to do that, you're going to go to the anion and come up with its charge. You can look that up on your reference sheet. You have two of them giving you a net negative charge of minus two. We know that the positive and the negative charge have to equal zero. And since there is just one copper, it has to be plus two. And that's why we have a Roman numeral two. All right, the next one is a covalent compound. There are no metals. And it is going to be binary. And I see that there is a two there. That two tells me that there is going to be a prefix of di regular element name, nitrogen. There is only one sulfur. We do use the prefix mono in the second position and we always end the nonmetal in ide. Last but not least, I have another ionic compound and it is binary, so I'm gonna just cut it in half. Magnesium is a type one metal, so we just write its regular name. And then since there's just a single nonmetal in the back, we're gonna go ahead and end it in ide. When I say single nonmetal, I'm referring to the symbol, not the subscript. Remember that the subscripts really don't have any importance in naming binary uh, ionic compounds. Only in the ternary ionic compound, and that will help you predict the charge of the type 2 transition metal. All right, so we're going to do lots and lots of practice in class. Don't give up. This is really important. We will be referring to chemicals in all of the units that follow this, and so it's really important that you have a good grasp on being able to convert um, a chemical formula to a name, and then you'll see in the next section taking a name and converting it to a chemical formula. Have a good one, guys.